Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. My name's Chet Czar. I'm the host. And today I have a great interview with Thomas Nagovin of uh, Century Guild. Amazing dude, amazing company and book publisher. Uh, Thomas is an art collector, art dealer, book publisher, musician, filmmaker, and archivist, a bunch of, and probably a bunch of things I'm forgetting to mention, but really interesting guy, put out this amazing, amazing Mooka, Alphonse Mooka book uh, that is uh, a must own for anybody interested in um, Mooka or Art Nouveau or mysticism for that matter. Mysticism and art. Really incredible stuff. And he's got a Century Guild has a ton of other amazing books. So it was a good excuse to have him on since his book is uh, his uh, Mooka books out. And yeah, so it was a great, super fun conversation. Really good interview to come back from a two week break, an unintentional two week break. So I finished painting for my chaos show and that was kind of a nightmare. And, uh, that's, that's done though. The paintings are done and now I'm still, still in the hell. Uh, I, I have, uh, I, let's see, I'm casting frame corners and I, I made new frame corners for this show and, uh, they came out great. Uh, Lee Shamel hooked me up and made two molds for me in two days somehow. I don't know how he did that. And, um, so now I'm just casting every day and I have, uh, I have to, I have to paint half the frames because the molding I chose, uh, my framer could only find it in the color I wanted for about half the frames and the rest of them are in gold. So I had to sand everything and now I've got to paint them all and that's, then I got to add the corners. Oh my God. There's still so much to do. And the show is Saturday. If you're hearing this, when it debuts, it's this coming Saturday, October 9th. So it's been, uh, I'm still in the midst. You can probably tell in my voice, I'm a little bit uh, out of it. I'm just exhausted, but, um, it's done. We're going to have, I, I, I also have to make, prints for the show we're gonna, we're gonna offer prints of all the paintings of the show uh which is cool and um so i gotta print those up sign them certificates blah 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 oh my god so i'll be working up until the day of the show no doubt but anyway that's what i've been up to getting that done the dystopia i got the dummy book of dystopia sent to me i just got that this morning it looks amazing uh it's it's the book without any images on the pages. So it's just to look at the cover and the treatment on the sides of the pages, which is that black gloss that um, metallic that my black, my black magic book has. If you own that, you know what I'm talking about. And man, it's so thick. It's epic. This thing is huge. Man, <laughs> it's a thick book. It's crazy. Anyway, so that's I'm still scheduled to have that in November, so I can start shipping it out. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do about all those outside of the U.S. orders because shipping has gone up insane, insanely. It costs like it'll probably cost eighty dollars to ship that book to Australia. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to find a, a different shipping place. Woo wee. And then after the show's done, I got to start getting ready for the holidays. Cause that's my big time of the year. And all the supply chains are all fucked up from everywhere. I'm having trouble getting my printer paper. They keep running out. It's like COVID really screwed everything up for small businesses, especially. And you know, larger businesses too, because some of the suppliers I get my stuff from don't have their stuff. So I can't get my stuff. Crazy times, crazy times. But we're still here. We're still doing this podcast. And um, 
you can still join if you want to be part of the community you can join the dark art society patreon which is you can join for a dollar a month and it's at uh, patreon.com slash dark art society and let me read you the new subscribers from the last two weeks uh let's see samantha riggin thank you amy ragudi Amy upped her pledge, so that's great. Matt Tillett upped his pledge. Thank you, Matt. Okay, we got Gabriel Augusto Da Silva. Thank you. Uh, Lauren Budney. Thank you. Max Martelli. Ty Dobbs. And Robin Lagosi with a generous pledge. Thank you, everybody, so much. You are making this podcast continue and making it happen. And without your support, I couldn't do it. So that's it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's weird not having done the podcast for two weeks. Um, I just was. I was. I just didn't have time. I was working solid. I need a break. I seriously need a break. My back's killing me. But what choice do I have? If it's got to get done, it's got to get done. So anyway, the show is called Chaos. It's my solo show. It opens October 9th, Saturday, October 9th from 5 to 10 at Capro Gallery. And also showing that night is Dos Diablos, one of my favorite artists. And um, so we're kind of both doing two solo shows the same night. Uh, Dos Diablos designed the flyer for the show, which you can see online. And um, yeah, so I'm excited about that. We're going to, we got posters made we're going to be signing posters and prints and all kinds of stuff so it's going to be a blast a lot of people coming from out of town to see this show which is great so come on out if you're in the area uh, you can go to coprogallery.com for more info and I guess that's it I was going to do synesthesia word of the week but I'm too tired to even think of one right now so I'll get you back next week Anyway, let's get on with the interview. It's a really good one. Thomas Nagovin from Century Guild. Here we go. All right. Hope you like it, and I will talk to you all next week. Okay. Here goes. Almost there. Here comes the theme music. All right. Here it is. Oops, I forgot to say three, two, one. I started recording already. Hey, Thomas. <laughs> Welcome Chad. to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much. I, I apologize for the running around and changing. I'm usually really good about that, but I just got, it was, it's been so crazy. It's been all nighters. Well, most important thing. It's, uh, yeah, that's important. Yeah, you get. Yeah, you gave the best answer. You're like your show's the most important thing, so don't worry about it. And I was like, oh, that makes me yeah. feel better. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, like twenty years from now, the art is what matters, and if it, you know, right, that's what you have to spend your time on. The yeah. painting, most important. Yeah, we should clarify the show, meaning not the podcast. Meaning right, right, my <laughs> chaos show. Well, I'll, I will, I will record an intro to this, so I will preface okay. it. But yeah, yes, my, my chaos show, which is. The worst of it's over. I'm just doing frames now, so I'm like nice and relaxed, ready to do a nice, fun interview. So, uh, yeah, I was. <clears throat> it's funny because it's like Century Guild has has always been this thing I've heard about. I, I you you had a physical space for a while, right? In L.A. We did. We were based in Chicago for a long time, uh, and then in. Uh, 19, well, 1999 is when we started in Chicago. <clears throat> and then, uh, in 2012, we moved to LA. So we time our openings around, uh, apocalypses. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, we had the space in Los Angeles for five years hmm. and we closed it because we wanted to shift more towards, uh, the publishing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I started to feel like a nightclub owner, like we yeah. would have 
fantastic openings. And nobody buys anything, right? <clears throat> um, <laughs> everything we were selling, even if someone lived in Los Angeles, they would either want to come in on an off night or way more likely they would buy it over the internet. Exactly. And it was not that way 10, 15 years ago. Right. There was a lot of talk back then about will the internet wind up, not even will it wind up, people just said the internet does not offer stability uh, as far as uh, comfort for a consumer to purchase anything. Well, then, of course, <laughs> look at this now. Like yeah. Everything is on the internet. <clears throat> and I remember the first time when uh, someone dropped an expensive piece of art just into a cart and paid for it. Like right. older dealers like me were like, this is crazy. <laughs> like, they haven't was, even uh, seen it in person yet. Oh my yeah, God. I, well, especially with things like paint, you know, that that's another, I don't want to get too far off topic, but you know, that's another challenge is that really the best paintings have a luminosity to them. Um, and it's very, very often that they don't photograph well. Oh, tell me about and it. And on the inverse, <laughs> Paintings that photograph beautifully in person don't have a lot of that extra dimension. That's so true. And so that, to me, is a negative about people buying on the internet, is that there's a, you know, it's like the difference between a record and seeing a band live. Yeah. It's that's, that different. Yeah, that's how I always describe it, you know, with the uh, art shows are basically like... The difference between seeing a live band and hearing it on CD, which yeah. is there, there's the value right there. It's not even so much for the per, uh, purchasing of art as much as the community and the opportunity to celebrate with your fans and collectors and see this stuff in person, which is the only real way to see it. You know? Yeah, that was another. So, another reason about <clears throat> why we closed is I did realize that. It, it's so limited when it's geographically based. Right. And so something that I, you know, the, obviously the, the pandemic redirected a lot of time frames, but <clears throat> something that we're focusing on is trying to get more into thinking of, of shows just as exhibitions that don't need to be in a specific city or place. Right. And, and there's another, God, there's so many tangents here. I know. Uh, <laughs> Got plenty of time, don't worry. We've got a thing that we're doing uh, that's going to be it's a Kickstarter that we're doing in January, and it's called Temple of Medusa. And we've got 30 artists. And so the idea is that if you make a really, really gorgeous book and you do photograph things well and, and you create a tangible setting, at least in that sense... Um, that that's an exhibition that can go all over the world. Yeah. So we're doing it kind of as an experiment in terms of uh, making a themed book that's meant to be like a message in a bottle kind of exhibition. And and so, yeah, we've got 30 artists doing uh, interpretations of the Medusa myth. Oh, cool. And they, uh, the, the, the pitch is, what if Medusa was the hero of the story? Cool. <laughs> and so, you know, one of the uh, beautiful, beautiful paintings and speaking of an artist that uh, whose work doesn't translate on a photograph is Freya Dean, uh, who's actually Roger Dean's daughter. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. She's magnificent. Hmm. And, but so she did this beautiful, beautiful island where Medusa is calling her children in to uh dinner and she's standing in the doorway on this beautiful island and the idea is like what if she medusa wasn't this hunted and feared creature and so you know giving that kind of premise to uh creative people uh we got a lot of varying degrees of romantic and entertaining uh Ideas And in my head, this links, I guess, to the MUCA book. <clears throat> Part of my idea for this was, was the Salon Rosa Croix, which was the 1892 Salon that was the first symbolist uh, exhibition. And just, you know, we were trying to pick artists that would be 
applying a little bit of like a metaphysical or symbolist theme to it mm-hmm. instead of someone holding a bloody head. Right. <laughs> and so we try to get more into the, the uh, you know, kind of what the metaphysical ideologies of Medusa are and... Man, I got there's a lot of tangents. I'm yeah. just gonna back up onto <laughs> just the highway. Really, get, let it go I mean. where it goes. This is like a real <laughs> conversation. I mean, I I don't want to jump the gun either because I want to ask. There's so much I want to ask you about, particularly with symbolist art, and talk about this amazing, amazing book. And um, but first, what I usually do is kind of like let's get out, let's get this out of the way. Give me your background because you have this crazy varied background you had so many different projects you're a musician you're recording shit on wax cylinders you're (laughs) doing all kinds of you know amazing art books art gallery you're you've got quite a quite a history so um can you explain to the viewers who might not know that what do you think i do because i never know how to answer the question i'm always curious what it looks like it's I see you as an art dealer and publisher. That's but that's before I started reading up on you to prep for this um interview. And then I realized, oh, you're a musician and researcher and kind of an art historian and all kinds of different things. Yeah, I'm I am completely unemployable, is what that, <laughs> lo- <laughs> that long list says. Jack of all <laughs> trades. I I, I started kind of my my adult, you know, employment as an antique dealer, All right. uh, and and I worked in a um, a vintage poster gallery that sold Alphonse Mucha drawings and you know things kind of from that realm. And uh, before that, I had worked in a place that just sold antique furniture, but I've always been kind of the garage sale guy that just wound up getting the great job at the really high-end place downtown. And I grew up very lower middle class on the south side of Chicago. So it was it was like uh, Pygmalion. How, in did, term- how did you get into that line of work? It's such a weird, you know, antique I, dealer. It's like, especially coming from a lower middle class background, it's like, how did you I, do that? I, I, the comic book store the first day i ever worked was the day that the superman dies issue came out wow so my day of work was there was a line around the block and <laughs> i was laughing saying just so you know it's not always like <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool and um so I, I i had that job really really loved it and i spent all my money from every paycheck on comic books it's because you see everything that's coming out. Right. And I thought, all right, if I'm going to spend my money on where I work, I got to work somewhere that's more adult. <laughs> so I found this antique store that had really beautiful furniture. And like to this day, I still have a Victorian dressing screen that took me like nine months to pay off. Wow. That, but so I, I was doing that. And then I, I found a book on Art Nouveau. And I brought it in to the owner of the store and I said, what is this? And to me, it looked like, uh, you know, of course I was a fan of Michael Kaluta and Charles Vess and, uh, the studio artists and, Mm -hmm. uh, and of course like Michael Whalen and the Edgar Rice Burroughs Martian novels and all of that. And so I was like, what is this? And he said, Oh, that's art nouveau. You'll never see it. It's too rare. Really? Well, well, because it was an American <laughs> antique dealer. We were in Chicago. We uh, sold oak furniture. It was you don't just find a piece of Art Nouveau like right. in the base. And uh, I so I just kind of filed that away. I kept reading. I was learning about it. And so finally, I was like, man, I really want. And and also in this period, then I was discovering the artists from the 19th century, like Alphonse Mucha. Mm-hmm. And seeing, okay, this is, as a comic book fan, you, you're tracing the origins back, right? So who were these people looking at? Right. And so I discovered symbolist art. I discovered Art Nouveau illustration like Alphonse Mucha. And I said, all right, I want to work at a gallery that sells originals by these kind of artists. And I went downtown to a poster gallery 
And I remember asking some questions about like, well, do you get this? Do you get this? And they said, no, 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 you want to go to this gallery. And it was the place that was on Oak Street, which was uh, like next to the Armani store. Like it was the high, high end place. Mm -hmm. And so I went in there and I just, uh, I got really lucky that the person who was like the sole employee hadn't had a day off in eight months. Like he was just being worked to the bone. And so when I came in, <laughs> they're like, yes, <laughs> instead I was looking for a job. He basically like he connected with me, he was a young guy and uh, could see that I wanted to learn it and was enthused about it. Mm-hmm. And so he told the owner, I can teach this guy this stuff. You got to hire him. I need a wingman. And even more importantly, I need a day off. Right. <laughs> and so I got the job. And it was one of my fondest memories <clears throat> is that uh, is the day that the owner told me, uh, yeah, when we refer to Toulouse-Lautrec, we tend to not call him the guy. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, we don't say, yeah, Lautrec. He's the guy that dot, dot, dot. So I definitely was like Goodfellas. Like I was in there trying to sell this art. <laughs> Very crass. And then I remember him coming up to me and being like, yeah, we uh, we don't lean on the furniture while we're <laughs> so All of these things that were just like the polishing and the finish. And I was in there like – You wanted the came... adult job. You wanted the adult <clears throat> oh job. God. There it is. Like, <laughs> yeah, I came from having uh, – you know, like being somebody that worked – you know, selling slices of pizza right? <laughs> you know, and nachos into this thing. And so it was very, very cute. You know, I had like one suit and, <laughs> you know, so, but, but the good thing is that I, um, I learned. And one of the things that they kind of did to me is that the, the owner was really, really, really tough. And he would give me these stacks of books and it was like he was trying to get me to quit. And he would be, you know, he would say something like, okay, well, you know, read these and before you come back. And it'd be like, you know, six books. <laughs> but the thing is, I didn't know that that was a challenge because, again, I'm a comic book guy. I'm a reader. I'm into symbolism and mythology. Well, that's advertising. Right. And so <clears throat> inside of three months, I knew at least academically, more about what he was selling than he did. That's great. <laughs> and it was, I, there was one point where he was pointing to an artwork, and it was uh, an Alphonse Mucha lithograph for the Judgment of Paris. And he referred to it as the Judgment of France. Well, Paris is the name of the character. It's not the city. Uh. Like, didn't know any of that stuff, but he had great taste <laughs> and always, you know, big Sicilian guy always dressed in black and and then the other thing that he did is that every week when it was time to get paid he would say so tell me why you think you deserve to get paid this week wow (laughs) and it was like oh my god and he's like i just i think i don't know i don't know if this is working out i just don't see any strength from you and I would always be like, well, you know, I sweep the floors and I do the windows and then I do this and I clean this and I know this artist. And I, put, and I was constantly doing that, constantly, constantly. And then I wound up uh, – the, the way that it shifted is that when, it, when I finally – I mean, I guess this is kind of the movie moment. There was one week where he asked me that question and I interrupted him and said, oh, oh, I meant to, to tell you – to ask you. Tell me why I should come in to work tomorrow. <laughs> and he laughed, gave me the check, and then never asked me again. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Because at that point, like, I reached a point where I knew what I was doing so well. And so there's an article that I read. Uh, God, I don't remember what it was in. But the title of the article was In Praise of My Asshole Boss. <laughs> and the guy was talking about all the jobs he had with like people that he got along with and where he loved the manager. And he said, but I never learned as much as I did from, and he mentioned this one particular guy who was really brutal. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's a, uh, 
it was definitely a trial by fire and it definitely uh, taught me how to deal with uh, a world and a clientele that were light years away from anything I'd ever experienced growing up on the south side of Chicago. Right. And, and so then it just reached a point where uh, after working there for years, uh, I... Uh, was I was spending most of my time at that point as a musician, but you know, not really lucrative. And so I wound up uh, just doing little bits of brokering, buying and selling. I had quit working at the gallery to do more with music. And um, the there's just such a network there where there were collectors asking me, well, hey, can you help me find this kind of thing? And then other owners of artwork saying, do you know anyone that would be interested in this kind of thing? And mm -hmm. so I just kind of found myself being positioned in the middle of these two groups of people. And that's then when uh, I realized that it was prudent to just kind of keep one foot in that world. Uh, and it's kind of like... As, as brutal and as exhausting as it's been at different points, it never feels like work because every day you're looking at and talking about art. Right. So that was just, you know, so that was 1999 when I started the gallery and I'm old now. It's a long time. And so we had the space in Chicago. I'm older than you by a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> Three years older than you, so... <laughs> I know. 88. <laughs> you look good for 88. <laughs> um, and then the other thing, this is kind of funny because it relates to the, the dark art universe, is that the stuff that I wanted to buy and sell was the really dark symbolist art. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a guy who was a, a, a source for the poster dealers. And we had, this is like very, very early in, in my career as an independent person. What would happen is you talk to a dealer, they might have thousands of posters, but one that was really like dark and strange or weird or, you know, mystically themed or something. And so it would be where I would ask people, okay, what do you have that you can't show to customers? <laughs> <laughs> and so it would be something where it's like, oh, here's a poster with, you know, torture. Here's a Grand Guignol poster. Yeah. And so I You're remember. You're like the only other person I know that knows what Grand Guignol is. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us. Oh, my God. So I, I, uh, I bought this, this one grouping. And I remember that there was one piece in there that to me was the home run piece. And as he's telling me the prices, as he flips through them, okay, well, this one is X, this is Y, this is Z. He's saving the one that I really want for last. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> he knows, he knows that this is the one. I'm like, God damn it. So he's flipping through, he's totaling it up and he gets to that one. And I'm, I'm like taking a deep breath and he says, and I, I just have to give this one to you. Because you're never going to sell it. Whoa. I was like, okay. That he, never he happens. Just, he laughed and said, yeah, I've had this for like 20 years and no one will ever buy it. It was a piece that was a person with a skull open and he was doing an anatomical examination of the brain. And on the sides of it were the like nervous system in red. So it was just like these figures that looked like in the Watchmen when Dr. Manhattan is, is reconstituting himself and he's walking around and he's just the nervous system and eyes. Uh -huh. And it's from 1896. Wow. So it's this old, incredible, incredible thing. And, I, and ironically, that was the very first piece that I sold out of this collection that he was selling me. And he'd had it for 20 years and it was just, so we were really the first place that you could go. If you loved the things that were really sexual or mysterious or gory or any of that, mm -hmm. um, we were the, the only dealer 
and you know, again, this is 20 years ago, that specialized in that. Right. And so, yeah, if it was, so we definitely attracted a lot of rock stars and a lot of, you know, people who owned S and M clubs, like people who had money, right. a lot of club owners, <laughs> a lot of actors, a lot of, you know, people that had taste in art that was cool. Uh, that just, there was no dealer that, that specialized in that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's like, it's a, it's such a, a niche market, but really it's, you know, in, in, I think in, in this day and age, that's a, that's a plus because everything is so much more specialized now. You know, it's like, it seems like there's a community for every type of person. There's artwork for every type of person. And it's like, that's, that's, you know, maybe uh, you were ahead of your time. Uh, I think that it might have always been that way. I think yeah, maybe. The that makes a huge difference is the internet. Right. You know, like it's so True. easy. You know, when Timothy Leary, when they, when they uh, asked him, like, okay, once you're turned on, what do you do? And he said, find the others. Right. <laughs> well, how did you do that back then? Right. You know? Like, we didn't have a website when we started. I remember a girl I was dating, her brother-in-law was building websites. And I was like, what is this? Right. And he said, <laughs> he said you're going to see. And he showed me, like, you know, and this is, I mean, this is, you know, in the 90s, in the early 90s. Uh -huh. He showed me what a URL looked like. And he said, you're going to see those, like, on the side of a bus. And I was like, you're <laughs> yeah, like, whatever. Yeah. Exactly. I was like, there's no way. What is this thing? That's crazy. <laughs> and then I kind of look at it now. Now it's like virtual reality is the next. It's everything. Exhibitions and stuff. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you, except in the sense that I think that you just had to work harder. Yeah, you're right. Full sense. Because um, even like, you know, when it comes to. It, you know, it used to be, I think about the subculture surrounding mysticism mm -hmm. or hermeticism or any of that stuff. It's like those people were always there and right. you'd find them and you'd latch onto them hard because it was, you know, like again, finding the others, finding your people. And the difference now is like, now there's a fucking Facebook group for like, you know, symbolists in your area. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true. It's true. Um, I guess it depends on where you live too because i know that in the 80s there was a huge occult community i mean it was kind of easy to run into someone that was into that sort of thing in the 80s in hollywood you know and it's yeah. like uh it's it's kind of it's becoming mainstream now which i think is is, is actually good but um uh, I always took it for granted because I live near a big city like Hollywood or L.A., you know, but there's people out in the middle of bumfuck Egypt that nobody in there, they're the only person in their town that's interested yeah. in that sort of thing, you know? So the Internet's been like a lifesaver for these people. And the, the flip side to that is I think that the Internet, I mean, you know, people say this, it's a cliche, that it's a tool I think that the the ability to utilize this tool of the internet to find the others, to find your community, to present what you're doing in a larger way is unprecedented and magnificent. And then I think that the downside to it, like the, the, the first advice that I give an artist um, that's anywhere short of really, really being in full control of their faculties. The first advice that I give them is do not post your work online. Hmm. And the reason is because the people that are giving you positive or negative. Yeah. Critique, oh, I've talked about this many times. <laughs> well, my, I don't know if this, I, my, they're not qualified to do so. Totally. That's yeah. You know, I, yeah, if yeah. you're, really pretty girl everybody's gonna like everything you or it's do. like you know these people most of these people are your friends you know they're not yeah. going to give you constructive criticism they're going to tell you that's amazing you know and you're just going to get all this positive feedback to the point where you're not even learning what what good is 
Yeah. Yeah. It's obviously I'm doing good because everybody loves it. They're all telling me it's great. You know, that's. And, and your work can sell because right. you build a following and, and maybe it's not where it needs to be. And think right. about like in the 80s where if you were a guitarist, you had to sit in your room and play the same parts over and over and over and over and over and over. Right. And then get a show. Like by the time you got on stage, you were really ready for it. Right. And so people will post like, oh, I just did this little doodle. And then everyone says, oh, that's great. And then and then you never really finish it. Right. Because you got the experience. And, and then the valve, the pressure valve of intellectual and emotional. Like how many times did we sit with an idea because we didn't have people to talk to about right. it and let it build and then you gain new perspective on it. And it becomes a work of art. Whereas now it's like you could just vent on the internet and the right. that's, least it ever builds. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's just with any, any of innovation as big as the internet, there's always going to be this balance of power, you know, the good and bad is going to come with it. Overall, I do think it's for the artist, especially for an artist who, is willing to do the work, knows what they're doing, has put their time in. It's, you know, it's kind of amazing to be able to reach a huge audience. I mean, back when my dad was an artist in the 70s and 80s, it's like you had to get a gallery show and and or take an ad out in an art magazine. You know, yeah. it's like that was it. Yeah, that was really it. And it's like now at least if you don't have any money, you can get your artwork out there, but yeah, I say that all the time, especially to younger artists. I've talked about this in the podcast a lot of times where it's just like, you know, so many people are showing their work before it's ready and getting the wrong kinds of feedback. You know, they're not getting critiques. And, and, but uh, I do so something you just said. I really personally, um, you know, as someone who is a gallerist, like I hate art galleries. Like I think <laughs> that most gallerists – you know, I mean, I, I don't want to be disparaging about it, but I think most of them don't add value. It may, maybe they love art, maybe they want to get into it. And so the idea that now that someone as an artist can directly connect to the people that love their work is fantastic. And that's the way that it should be. And I think that the, uh, advantage that people that are our age have is that because we came up before the internet right we can kind of have that perspective on it yeah the thing is hopefully and the words you said is if someone has the drive and the dedication is yeah hopefully people can step away from it a little bit and then utilize it because it's like it is a two-handed sword mm -hmm. it did not exist a quarter of a century ago yeah like it's not that long but it's, I do love that. I really love. I mean, I'm all over Instagram looking at people's art and right. It's amazing how much yeah. amazing work there is. I I've I would have been totally happy to do it the traditional way, where you show in a gallery and they deal with everything, and I just get to paint and get paid and supply yeah. the work, get paid. But it's like I've never been able able to make that work. It's never been an option for me, so I had to sell direct and, and start a business, which was great. Cause it really, you know, made me a more well-rounded person and maybe learn, you know, business and marketing and customer relations. And it's like, that really made me a better person. Um, cause I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a hermit and like most artists, I, I prefer to just paint. I just want to paint, paint, paint. Cause I love it so much, but it's like, you know, it's still, I think those days are kind of over for, for artists. I don't think it's, it, it, only in rare cases can you do that. Let me say this. You like you are an example of the kind of artist that's ideal for a gallery to work with. The times when I've had problems is when someone has a romantic idea that they're going to paint, you're going to do the work. And then there's expectations that are set mentally and internally in the artist that don't get met and it's because it wasn't clearly articulated. Mm -hmm. And so the artists that I've had the most positive experiences with are the people like I'll, I'll use an example. Dave McKean is someone I bring up all the time. Mm -hmm. He's great. As 
just a dream to work with. Mm. We become good friends and he's super balanced in his emotions and his intellect. He's not crazy. He's not crazy. Well, <laughs> we're all crazy. But it's like a point to yeah. utilize it. He's a great business person. And so it's effortless because the expectations are really clear. And it's kind of like, it's like if you go into a restaurant and you tell the waiter, well, I don't really, you know, just bring me food. And then they bring it. And then you say, well, this, I don't eat chicken. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, you didn't tell me that you don't eat chicken. Right. And, and so I'm just saying this, that, that in the sense of, I do think that unless you're in New York in the nineties, that the idea that you don't have to learn anything about how the business works, um, is, is detrimental to an artist. Oh yeah. The, uh, oh, I was just, but the point I just wanted to make is that, and this is kind of why I rag on galleries a little bit is the way that I got into it was just because I had artist friends that needed somebody to be helping them sort the business out, which is exactly what you said. Hey, I want to paint. Can you talk to this person who right. wants my painting? And so I was always coming at it as an artist advocate. Like I right. wasn't, it was had nothing to do with the money. It was a love of the work and trying to bridge the gap between people. And I, I feel like that's just less expected when someone thinks they're going to become a gallery owner. Right. Like in their heads, like they're not thinking, um, yeah, I'm an artist advocate. Like that's kind of the point. Like right. what am I And it comes from my background as an archivist and historian that I'm wanting to kind of keep that perpetuating. This is going to be a 17 hour. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I love, before we move on another subject, because, because I I want to get into symbolist art, but, um, in your book, but, uh, I mean, I feel like I sort of, my career, my art career is kind of like, a good example of the modern art, the modern artist having a career nowadays, because it's like, I still do, I still do a solo show, you know, a year or every two years or so at Copro gallery. We have a great relationship with them. I curate shows once in a while and stuff, but I, it's, you know, it's, uh, so I have that. So I'm always, I, I am showing at a gallery at least twice a year at for the, you know, the I want to support the gallery and um because he was he supported me early on and uh, and it's also I I love getting people together to see the work in person that's important to me and um but I can't afford to just live on on even one solo show a year if I did it and I was doing one solo show a year for for forever and I just couldn't afford to live on that so it's like I have my own business and I'm selling my prints and my merch and all this stuff um, and then I'm also doing the, the the gallery thing, but just not, it's not exclusively the gallery thing. So it's like, I think that's kind of what you need to do to make it work, but you could even do it without the gallery thing nowadays, whether, you know, it's, there's a, there's you, there's a something you give up there because I think showing in a gallery setting is important for your yeah. career and for the experience, like I said, of sharing the thing and really building a, a strong relationship with your fans and collectors but if you don't have the option, it can be done now, you know? Yeah. I, you know, it's kind of funny cause I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about like, I'm saying this in a funny way. Like, so if I had to critique what you're doing, I, I couldn't find anything that I would critique. Like you really are doing everything. Like if someone on paper was saying, uh, yeah, this is totally ideal. The thing I'm laughing about hearing you say this is that you think that you're normal in your ability <laughs> <laughs> to do. Like we were talking about, like Brahm said, you're like the James Brown. You're like the hardest working artist. Like you know, and what you got to do is you have a podcast, you make your prints, and you just paint your solo show, and then of course you got to do a group show, and you do this. I've also taken up animal husbandry, and I ride a unicycle. <laughs> So, yes, I do agree <laughs> with you that the way you're doing it. But I'm laughing because it's, you know, for being part of that introverted camp that artists live in, right? Right. Like, 
very, very, uh, yeah, you know, you're very charming. You're also very able to be focused and all those things. And so, yes, you're a great role model. I'm just laughing. <laughs> you think it's normal in any way. You're like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I, it wasn't natural for me. It was something I had to do. And it was like, yeah. it, the main thing was, I'm going to make this work. I don't I have to do this. I watched my, my dad struggle his whole life with his career up and down, you know, being a commercial artist and a fine artist. And he was not good at business at all. And so that's the reason I initially didn't get into being a fine artist because I watched it. I, you know, lived with it where we were just broke most of the time. And, um, so I got into makeup effects because I was really I got really into that when I was like twelve years old. It really yeah. into horror movies and creatures and stuff. So I got into that also because I it seemed like a good career path. And um, so then when I got out of it because I got sick of it, I'm like, this is this is not what I'm supposed to be doing anymore. I'm supposed to be doing creating fine art. And it was like you know I didn't do it until I was 33 years old. I didn't take that. I didn't make the decision. So I was like, this has to happen. <laughs> there's no other option. So I'm going to do whatever it takes, which meant I had to learn how to do business. I had to learn how to do marketing. I had to go talk to people. I didn't know. I had to go to galleries. I had to network all the shit that artists don't want to do. And uh, it was great though. Cause it made me, I would have never imagined doing a podcast even back then. I just didn't think I had it in me. The most it. important thing I think that people should hear with what you just said is that it is learnable. Yeah, absolutely. That, that it's not, dude. I was the biggest, biggest, biggest introvert on the planet. Same here. Ever, ever talked to people? I was, and this friend of mine who was a nightclub owner, which very entertainingly is now the guy who owns Gallery Fleeter Mouse. I remember him sitting with me <clears throat> in his nightclub, and he was looking at me, and he said, "I just feel like you're just in this shell." <laughs> and I want to help figure out how to get you out. <laughs> and I was like, and so the first time he was buying Egon Sheila things from us, and this is before, this is you know, 20 something years ago. And I remember going to his nightclub and he had this basement that was just this complete decadent Weimar era Berlin. Wow. Era. You know, so we, he takes me through this coat check thing. We go through down these stairs through these curtains and they part and the music hits me and there's just like half naked bodies writhing all over each other and i have my coke bottle glasses and an armload of books <laughs> and it was like orpheus in the underworld and i'm following this guy and people just like rubbing their hands all over his bald head and and it was so weird and but i use i literally like the before picture of the book nerd holding the books and right. <laughs> I, you know, but so you, yes, you can learn how to be more you. Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, kind of a funny, not necessarily a segue to the Mooka book, but the point of hermeticism and the point of those things, I am absolutely not in any way. Like if someone tells me they're interested in occult practices or anything, I usually just run the other way. <laughs> I but won't mention point, it, though, because I am. Yeah, but, <laughs> but the point to me of symbolism and the point of those types of, of studies or, or interests is self-awareness. Absolutely. And so more than 100%. anybody learning the business, because the business is shitty. Business is like, that's not the fun part. Yeah, the part exactly. Is self-awareness. Yep. And being able to look like when you go into Copro, and you say, hey, guys, I need this, 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 and this. Can you help me? And they say, yeah, we can do that. Right. And you, and so in, in your case, you have found good people that will meet you communication to communication. It's like that idea that the Holy Grail is the space between the two faces that makes, right. you know, it's communication. Yeah. And so that to me was, has always been like the sign of success is when someone really knows themselves. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is see, cause I think this is where, um, this is like the ultimate goal of art and magic. Cause I, I am into magic. I'm, I'm totally into it. So yeah, um, I, do. I just, most yeah. people are like, it's Oh yeah. Possible. It's, it's, but then, it, you know, it's kind of like that too. There a lot of people that are, 
that claim to be artists are kind of flaky yeah. too. But so so it's you know you know how it is. But um, th- this is the the real goal of it. You know, on one hand with art, it's like you could make a living from it. I can make money doing something cool. Um, yeah. But the re- what's really happening is that you're 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 learning about yourself you're becoming like you said you're becoming more yourself you're understanding yourself and the same thing with with uh magic and occult practices it's like you can do these results kind of results magic and manifest things and manifest money and stuff but once you see that you realize the point of it is is self-awareness it's all about that's why they're 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 kind of the same thing art and magic i I think is is uh they're they're about self-awareness you know getting more self-awareness ultimately i uh sign me up i'm on it (laughs) (laughs) and and, and the other thing one last thing i'll say about the subject is that uh one thing i found was that it became having to learn business to in, in order to create my artwork in order to be free from my other job and to make up effects it was like, okay, I have to do these things I don't want to do in order to do this thing I have to do, yeah. that I love to do. And so I was forced to put something bigger than myself above me and serve that thing. I was forced to serve the art. And I was like, and that was, and that's basically kind of like this ego death situation. It's like the spiritual thing. It's where you're going, you know what? Uh, there's something larger than myself that I'm serving. So I'm going to do whatever, I'm going to do whatever you need to make you happen. And b- by doing that, you have to get, you have to put, put all your bullshit aside, be willing to do uncomfortable things. And, uh, uh, and that makes you into the, into who you're meant to be, who you, who you are on the inside. You know what I mean? I, yeah, it's so. It's beautiful to hear you articulate it in that way. It's, I agree completely, and yeah, it's it's inspirational to hear you say it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's really cool. So let's okay, let's talk about this book. This book is, I was tell I I started to tell you beforehand. You know the the, I can't think of a a cooler art book. Uh, the closest thing I could think of that's on the same level as the is the Giger Necronomicon book. That thing that, that was that was uh, that was inspiration <laughs> in this case. Really? Because it's yeah, huge it for one thing, but it's so beautiful. It's so perfect. So talk about it. Tell people about this it's book. Funny, it's the unbelievable. Comic book store where I worked had the Necronomicon in the glass case. Oh wow! And it was one of those things where if you ever saw someone that had one, you were like, "Can I look at that?" Yeah. <laughs> and so I did. That's really funny that you say that because that was like in my head. I was like, I want a book that's that level of like fuck you like, yeah yeah <laughs> it's really uh, yeah it's not like there it's you weren't worried about cost on this one because it's thick too it's it's got a lot of pages kill a, you could kill somebody with that yeah. book. It, it's <laughs> heavy and big and um so talk about it tell me about it tell the audience about it well the book is uh le pater um Alphonse Mucha's Symbolist Masterpiece and the Lineage of Mysticism. And it is, it's designed and created to be what it felt like to read one of the Symbolist era books, like from the way the book feels and looks and, and all of that. And so, I mean, the, the, the kind of Reader's Digest version is that Alphonse Mucha, uh, the preeminent Art Nouveau illustrator, um, combining nature and just a perfect, perfect sense of line. Yeah. And, yeah. and everybody, if you see his work, you recognize it. Yeah. And the advertising art was, was, was kind of um, the bane of his existence. What he wanted to do, uh, he had intense interest in Freemasonry and sacred geometry. And yeah, all I had no idea. I was reading that in there. I was like, I can't believe well, it. I mean, you know, in, in keeping with what you said about the ego death stuff, people don't see what's beneath the surface. They right. see just that tip of the iceberg. So the amount of work that you did to get to where you are now, people don't see that. Right. So people look at Alphonse Mucha's art 
and they try to draw like that and they might not as the person in that moment understand why it's not just resonating and this is a really funny simple small example that i have to say i uh i'm I'm not a metallica fan okay (laughs) kirk hammett is one of the coolest people i've ever met yeah he's all into the dark art yeah i'm trying to i want to get connected to that guy because i think he'd like my artwork he's so nice so wonderful just you know it's just not my my genre of music right i had the opportunity to see him play in a small nightclub and my fucking brain melted. And I thought I was like, that's, this is why this guy's a rock star. And it was just one of those things where whatever it is, like it's, it is, it's so clear to me that it's not an accident. Right. And, and, and what I mean by that is it's like when they talk about, they used to say in Hollywood, like, Oh, she's an it girl. Meaning like she's got it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just saying like, so then now when I understand how much Kirk as a little monster kid sat in his room and learned Bach and just hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months. It's like, well, now I get why he picks it up and it's just so soulful. and And so the, the, the connection here with mentioning Kirk and mentioning you and then Muka is people look at this art nouveau art and they say, Oh, it's so pretty. I'm going to draw like that. Right. And so what most people, uh, and including me, uh, didn't know, don't know is that the art that he was doing was a byproduct of his incredibly deep spiritual practice. Mm. And so he was, incredibly devoted to mysticism, Freemasonry, sacred geometry, the relationship of humanity to nature. So cool. All these things. And so when he was making like a beer poster, the reason that every line is so perfect is that his understanding, not just of sacred geometry, but the, the lineage of mysticism. Right. That led to him learning to draw. Uh, it's just, it's so deep that, yeah, it's like that, that it girl, like, does he have that soul? Does he have that resonance? And so he created, in 1895 is when he came on the scene and skyrocketed. And in 1899, he had made so much money for his publisher that he had a, a card to play, which is, I want to make something that we print 510 copies of and destroy the plates. And I just want full creative artistic control. Wow. (laughs) And so he did it and they used lithography and uh, typography and engravings, like all of this rolls in together to be something that certainly was not profitable. Because right. back in the day, they would print thousands of something, and then they'd put it on biscuit tins and on silk canvases and dressing screens. And with this, the plates were going to be destroyed. Right. So he made this uh, series that was his retelling of the Lord's Prayer. And to say that this looks like the Lord's Prayer is like saying that you're doing a Martha Stewart commercial. <laughs> <laughs> looks like this weird post-apocalyptic dreamscape and then there's these strange mandalas that are based in this hermetic sacred geometry that have a lot more to do with 17th century metaphysical diagrams and but it all has that beautiful beautiful art nouveau element to it and so the point of the book is to present the art but also address a problem that I'd had for the last 20 years, which is that if you look it up in other MUCA books, they would say, oh, well, he just made all these things up from his imagination. And right. it's like, well, no, he didn't. There's centuries of coding in there, and it's that idea of, um, you know, the occult idea of hiding it in plain sight. Right. So every... I mean, it took me 20 years of research. That's what I was going to say is how did you 
how did you find this out? Because I'd never heard anything like that about Mooka. Um, the only thing that I can think of is that because the people that were interested in Mooka after the hippie movement were like old rich people <laughs> and, you know, who aren't into that kind of stuff. So like he did a book that was on um, seances that wow. he did scientific experiments in his studio. There's a book with uh, this military guy named Erosius and uh, the book exists like you could have bought it in 1900. It's so crazy. But that's never mentioned. Right. Um, and so um I think this is purely speculation. I just think that through the 70s, 80s, 90s and aughts that the people that were into Mooka were into the beer posters and into the fact right. that they were bull and rare and um and a lot of it was just, you know, like there was a, a cafe where he used to hang out with uh, Gauguin and uh, Strindberg and uh, Madame Charlotte's Creamery. The only book on it was printed in an edition of 200. Um, and it's just one of those things where like it's 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 it was hard to track down. Uh, but to find that and then find. Um, you know, the biggest source for me is old newspapers, magazines. Wow. Uh, you know, there's an article, it's like Alphonse Mucha and the New Mysticism that came out in, I think it was like 1904 in America. And, but so you just find those things and, uh, it takes a long time. And then the, the hardest part is the symbolism. Um, because it's um, it's not it's not transparent, you know. Like as any as you know, if you've studied some of these elements of hermeticism and mm -hmm. mysticism and things like that, is that um, if you are a researcher, researcher, oh, I see anything, right? It's not on the surface right like it's right not like oh you know is there a book that has all these drawings and you know like what and it also um it, it's uh muka was also i mean he would never call himself a symbolist um but when it came to his coatings he definitely was using things that were rooted in symbolism so it's like you have to have like an adept understanding of symbolism and uh, of Hermeticism and Freemasonry and all of these things. And so basically what this big hardcover book is, is it reprints Mooka's artworks to scale and it gives you like the idiot's guide to Hermeticism. Like it just walks you through so cool. everything that you need to know to look at his work and understand like, so why is the like his version of God is hermaphroditic, right? It's like a female deity, mm. like it was kind of the way it presents. Well, why was he using that in the 1890s? Like that's very, it would be crazy now, right? You know, or avant-garde now. Why, yeah. why 1890s? Yeah. I, um, you know, there's this weird post-apocalyptic landscape and there's this, big earth mother that's got three breasts creating rivers of milk mm. that mankind is eating from like well why you know what does the trinity represent to him and was there a point where you were you like it, it a light went off and you kind of was like oh shit this is like you know this is metaphysics this is like hermeticism was there like a point where, or was it slowly, or did you know a little bit before you started researching him? What when I first was was working at that gallery that I mentioned in Chicago, um, I went to a, one of the, the small poster fairs, and I was flipping through someone's prints, and there was uh, an image of a, a ghostly figure floating surrounded by all of these Lovecraftian demons. Mm -hmm. 
And it was like a Virgil Finley illustration times 100. It was so masterful and beautiful. Well, I look, of course, okay, the name's Alphonse Mucha. It's so good, but it's so creepy and spooky. Uh. What is this? I don't know, but I need to buy it. <laughs> and so I bought it. And when I would look in books, it would mention, okay, this is from Le Pater, but there were never pictures of it. Hmm. It, it, it would, the point is it was mentioned just as a footnote. Uh, and he said that it was the, his masterpiece. It was the thing he had put his soul into, but they never showed pictures. Wow. Of it. I guess, cause it didn't fit in the rest of the narrative, the way he was being presented by mainstream art well, culture. A lot of books just kind of keep regurgitating the information. Right. And then the other part is that they're rare. They only made 510. Hmm. And then there's your two world wars later. Like how right. many... And so years later, uh, and by years, I mean like maybe it was two or three because I was really actively looking for one. And again, this is really pre-internet. Like auctions weren't online yet. It mm -hmm. wasn't like Christie's had that sorted out. But so I was able to find a complete copy uh, and that, so I knew that it had symbolist and mystical elements, but I was not at that point versed in understanding what these symbols were. So did you learn about that stuff through this research? Yeah, I, I would say that my interest in like Jakob Burma and, and Robert Flood and uh, Giordano Bruno and things like that were developing separately. But what would happen is I would be then reading a book or looking at someone's diagrams from the 17th century and I would recognize something. Right. And I would say, that's in Le Pater. <laughs> you know, 300 years later, 400 years later, wow. oh, I know where he got this. Or I know, like, and then it wasn't that he maybe, uh, it wasn't like he was flipping through a book looking for inspiration. It's that he was part of an educational lineage and discipline right. that were using these things as their textbooks and as their, you know, their ways of using symbols to understand what our relationship was to the universe and each other. Right. And, nature. and which is just an interesting side note, when Le Pater was released, some of Mucha's language got censored for the Czech Republic because it was too hippie. So wow. they made like, make it less about the manifestation of the ideal spiritual human and more about put your trust in the arms of God. Wow. Yeah. So that was, <laughs> which is, we've got a soft cover edition that's coming out at the very end of the year. And I mention it in passing in the hardcover that you have, mm. But that's kind of the bonus material in the soft oh, cover. Oh, how cool. That I, I, I put the, the check text. To be honest, it's kind of depressing. Yeah, it's a it, bummer. <laughs> yeah, but the reason I didn't put it in the hard cover is because it's... You don't want to taint the, the cool book. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, it's like, um, you know, like, it, you know, when, when, when a person dies, the idea that then their soul can be of service to God... Whereas Mooka's thing is more like, no, 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 we're on this planet. We are all struggling in the mire. Mm -hmm. And we have to be good to each other. And we have to focus on exploring the darkness in ourselves to find yeah. the illusion this in our best. Is, like, to me, man, that's so much more interesting. That's, and, that's the Gnostic thing. You know, that's yeah. the that's the, the root of, you know, true occultism and magic and all that stuff. It's Well, the Czech Christians... Christians didn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Just like that's got to go. We got to change that part. Um, it's, ama but, it's so amazing. I, can't, I I'm just I'm I'm really tripping out because it's like I I looked through the book and kind of skimmed over things and I was like he was a mason, you know. I'm like reading all this stuff and um, and now you're telling you're you're, you're all those masonic jewels and it's, it's those were the hardest thing to find in the book. Really? Yeah, we got photographs of all the jewelry that he designed for the Masonic Lodges. Oh, my God. How um, amazing would it be to have one of those? <laughs> that, that was the hardest thing to find. It's so crazy. So, And that's part of why this took so long. And How long did it take? I mean, well, 
to it, make the so book. I had been researching it just for myself. And then we did a small exhibition at the gallery of the artworks. And we did a little soft cover catalog and it did incredibly well on Kickstarter. And I thought that this thing that I personally was just into and was kind of doing as a, like for me time, Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, this is actually, people do want to see this. I, I should devote more energy to this. And so then I thought, okay, well, look, I should treat it as if I was walking someone through the gallery and telling them, okay, this is what this means. This is what, uh, and, and print them to scale, print them so that somebody can feel like they have one of these, you know, rare and expensive original Muka works in front of them. Right. You can really, really dig into the detail. And, and so then we did a Kickstarter for that. And then in the course of writing it, um, a couple things happened. One is that more museums had, had come online with their holdings. And so it was making some elements of the research more rewarding than it had been even five years earlier. Hmm. So the deeper that I was digging into it, I was finding more things than I had before in terms of like old, you know, uh, articles or press clippings or, you know, different things. And then the other part is that because we were printing the book so large that like there's a, a, um, a beautiful, beautiful William. I mean, you can tell that the examples I picked to support the story are all the creepy ones. There's right, a big yeah. <laughs> William Blake of, of, a, of the, uh, you know, this weird lizardish yeah. devil. So cool. And so the museum sent me the file for it. And I said, okay, oh man, I really hate to be a pest, but can you send me like the raw file because I need it bigger? So they sent that to me. And I, I said, guys, I hate to be a pest, but <laughs> is there any way that I could get a bigger file of this? And the guy laughed. He said, how big is this book that you're making? <laughs> like, I had, like, he must have been thinking, like, are you making a poster? What are you doing? <laughs> and so there were museums that were willing to work with me to rephotograph oh. things. Things like tracking down the metals, getting a photographer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's amazing. It's ama- There's so many. It's there's so many amazing pictures in there. It's like so f- well, jam packed. I, I hate, hate, hate when I buy a book, and I can tell that they've used a low resolution JPEG. Oh yeah, <laughs> all the time. So for me, I wanted it to be where you just couldn't have made a better quality. Yeah, it's it, that's that's that was my feeling looking through it. It's like it just doesn't get any better than this, you know. This is as good as it gets as far as art books go. So the Kickstarter was supposed to be like a, you know, 9 month turnaround and it turned into 3 years. That's what happened to my book. 5 years. I'm, oh. uh, it's coming my book's coming out next month finally and it took 5 years. <laughs> but well, it's not because of the research. It was because I I could not wrap my mind around trying to organize the material for my book because it's a mythologizing of of all the paintings I do as if it's a alternate dimension but anyway so I it, I understand it, it, it's the same kind of work it was really like there were times with La Pater where I thought my brain was going to start bleeding out of my ears ah, it was a nightmare I totally feel your pain man. like three-dimensional chess and mm-hmm. Being a four or five hundred page version would have been easier. It's getting it down and right. People were brutal. Like I had. Oh, I feel so bad for you. <laughs> oh my God. This is what's really funny. So <laughs> there were people that were just like, like people were saying things like, just release it the way it is right now. Right. And I was like, but it's not right. It's not done. Like I wouldn't be giving you the best. Right. And so. I just was, I had to refund people left and right. Oh my God. And I did it just because people would start, 
being really terrible. Yeah, and, I and was then like, they're just trying to start egging people on in, in the yeah. comments. So and, and you, I just would refund their money and I would say, just come back and buy it. If you're still interested right. when it's available for retail, I apologize. But so the funny segue here is that one of the people who, so I would get notes from people saying, uh, you, you need to focus on the work kind of like exactly what I was telling you yeah. the other day, <laughs> focus on the work. And one of the people who kept hammering that home for me was Elias marriage, the director of begotten and shadow of the vampire. Hmm. And he and I are like, he's one of my best friends. And so he would tell me constantly, he's like, man, you got to tune that out. The work is what's important. Yeah. I came, and, up, I came upon that realization myself too. At a certain point I was like, I'm like literally my hair's falling out. I can't sleep at night. It's like yeah. I, I just had got to a point where it's like I'm doing the best I can. I just need to focus on getting this done and get into it and love it again. You know, well, you, can't, you can't do customer service and art at the same time. No, I just had to kind of disengage in that way. Yeah. And but so one of the other notes that I got that meant a lot to me was uh, a woman named Linda Moorcock, who happens to be married to Michael Moorcock. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, for the listeners who don't know, Michael Moorcock is the author who invented the concept of the multiverse. Whoa, okay, wow. So in the 1960s, he did a series of books about this character called the Eternal Champion, the most famous of which is Elric. You've seen Brahms' Elric. Yeah, movie. yeah, yeah. That's Michael Moorcock's books from oh, the 60s. Oh, wow, wow. And she said... I'm married to an author. I'm just telling you, you got to just focus on the work and tune out. Like, and the point is anyone who was a good creative knew exactly what I was going through. and was right. like, yeah. But so fast forward to like kind of the, the validation for me is that I was, I was collating quotes for the back cover of this paperback edition that's coming out at the end of the year. And, and one of the, the people, I mean, someone who was a huge, huge influence on me is Michael Moorcock. He's anyone that's interested in the universe of, of graphic novels or comic books mm. or fantasy or anything doesn't understand how deep of a debt everything has. Like all roads lead to Michael Moorcock. Right. And so he was one of the people that I asked for a quote. And he had such a hard time giving me a quote that he wound up writing the introduction to the book. Oh, he cool. <laughs> Narrow them down. And he just said so many beautiful things. You would think that like my mom wrote it. Right. Or me. How cool is that? How about, this is, like I, I consider myself a bibliophile and this is the most beautiful book that I own. And I learned all the, you know, he was friends with Muka's family. Wow you know, just felt really impressed and proud. And so to me, that was like the ultimate validation for the years that I spent on it is mm -hmm. that this person who to me was one of the most seminal influences is telling me that it's, you know, their yeah. favorite that they own. And I was like, Oh my God. It's, it's gotta be, I mean, just taking your trying, I know it's hard, but trying to, you know, not toot your own horn, but this has got to be the most important Mooka book that's ever been created, don't you think? I mean, try not to. I know it's hard to say that about something you made, <laughs> but I mean, th to me, this seems like it's it's. There's nothing else like it. Every other Mooka book you get is like a Mooka book, it's just like an art book, you know, cool uh, artwork, but. Roger Dean gave me a really great quote, and one of the things that he said is that he owns twenty Mooka books. And this one is his favorite. Right. It's and the, the best. Because out of those other books, it's the same images, the mm -hmm. same book recycled. You don't need, like, they're not adding anything new to the narrative. Um, and I would say that uh, anyone who's interested in Mooka, and I mentioned this at the very, very end of my book, you have to get the book that Mooka's son wrote. Oh, okay. Because from a narrative point of view, it's so deep and so rich that the historical information about Mooka 
that I have, 80% of it came from that book. Oh, wow. Cool. It's out of print, but it's it's there. And it's it's not as image heavy as other books. It's something you have to read. Right. Get it. But that, to me, is... Like, if you had three Mooka books, if you had Mooka's son's book, if you had, like, Alphonse Mooka, the complete posters and panels, and then you had this book, you wouldn't need... All the others, all the 20 others. <laughs> yeah, because it's, like, everything is, right. is there. But I, I do... I do um, I think that what happens when people are making books is that you get someone who writes a book, they're looking at other books and not necessarily doing period research. Um, right. I'm really, really big on, like, my library is filled with walls of hardcover volumes of periodicals from the 1890s through the 20s. Um, like, I'm very interested in Weimar Berlin. Yeah, and I, I can have, tell. Like, <laughs> the, the books that you publish are... It's but like, I have, like, walls of, of police blotter reports from... Wow. <laughs> so you're into it. ...and the serial killers of the... Tw- yeah, I have the police reports. Like, I, so I cool. Love, I love that research. I right. love that. Uh, I never went to college, but I'm voracious oh, with wow. the study. Well, that's... And, yeah, oh, that, well, that, that's... that's uh, Every... Every time you, you, you publish a book, I'm like, you know, this is a kindred spirit. You know, it's like everything you put out, especially when, well, I, like I saw the Grand, uh, Grand Guignol stuff is like, seriously, I, I, I don't, I always talk about it and nobody knows what I'm talking about because dark art is so related. The dark art scene is so, there's a, there's a connection to that, yeah. that kind of thing, you know, the Grand one, Guignol one my- is so weird. <laughs> One one of my secrets is that I have uh, I have probably the biggest collection of of Grand Guignol ephemera. Oh my god! Wow. Because, you know what's funny is that it was really hard when I started out. It was it was even though I was talking about that we were kind of a go to for a lot of that. We did sell things that were more romantic, and the stuff that was grotesque, like an ice pick to the face, mm-hmm. was uh, was was very hard to sell. And so the two things that I allowed myself to collect were things relating to the Grand Guignol and the Salon Rosa Croix, which there's a chapter on in the book that mm-hmm. was the symbolist art salon. And um, Eric Satie was playing the organ in the corner and they expected like 200 people to show up and, and they literally had to shut streets down. Wow. How many people? It was like one of your shows. <laughs> I've been able to get in. <laughs> so, it, but you know, that's what it was in Paris in 1892. Um, and it was this convergence of romance and art and mysticism. And so the, the Grand Guignol, if people don't know what it is, it was the theater of terror in Paris. It opened in 1897 and it was like blue man group with cow blood. If yeah. you were sick- front row and they slashed someone's throat on stage some guy smoking a cigar next to the side of the stage would then throw a bucket of cow guts into the audience right. and people vomit and it was it was uh, shock theater and everybody from uh, you know uh, uh, Alice Cooper mm-hmm. to Bill Toro will talk about this as being um, like people that are performers definitely know it. Mm -hmm. I was surprised. Like uh, we had some stuff up in our booth at San Diego comic-con and uh, the, uh, the guy who was the showrunner for star Trek, the next generation and Brent Spiner from star Trek. were both like hardcore into grind guignol. And it's like data's into grind guignol, but it's (laughs) yeah thing like it's it, it, you know it was like it raised the bar in such a huge way right and the theater closed in 1945 because after the war atrocities of world oh, war oh yeah it, it just it couldn't uh the world was was desensitized to it wasn't funny anymore right. it wasn't out to to have that but yeah that's a whole that's another three hour discussion i know that's the thing it's like it, y'all. <laughs> we're definitely Hopefully you'll come back on again because uh, there's a, there's a, there's a lot more to talk about. But what um, 
Uh, I wanted to, to, can you talk a little bit about um, symbolist art? Because I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I, I also didn't go to college. And, and, it, and it seems like most of us do, creating this kind of dark artwork really um, <clears throat> were influenced by horror movies, at least, especially, I'll, I'll speak for myself, horror movies, horror comics, the old EC comics, oh, yeah. Creepy and Eerie. H.R. Giger, Wayne Barlow, you know, uh, we grew up on this stuff. And, um, but, you know, at some point, and I've just been creating completely intuitively, like, this is what I think is the coolest thing to make. So I'm going to make it. And yeah. it's this, you know, dark stuff. And it wasn't, <clears throat> and, and, and when I first started painting, I couldn't, the only places that would show me were like lowbrow pop surrealist galleries because no one else yeah. would show me so i'd show there and it's like i don't really feel like i'm a pop surrealist or a lowbrow artist and uh at a certain point when um the the guy I used to do mike carell the guy I used to do the podcast with he made a documentary about me and um and we came to the realization that people call this stuff dark art it's really popular you know a lot of people love this what's being called dark art. So let's try, let's just go with that name and, and embrace it. And then we won't have to worry about naming it something. And, you know, everybody knows what that means. When you hear dark art, you kind of know what it means. You know, it's, it's pretty descriptive. And so <clears throat> part of this podcast has been kind of like, I don't know, public, public relations campaign to educate people about it. Also mainly to give other people who love this kind of artwork, some, a sense of community, a place to go, um, to hear about it and to, to, to hear the artists being interviewed and people involved in it tangentially, you know, like the way you, you are, you know, you're, you're doing stuff that I would consider dark art as well with a lot of these books that you're publishing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but at one point this art collector said, your stuff is I see your stuff as like symbolist art. And I was like, what's symbolist art? Cause I really, I don't have, you know, everything I've learned about art history is like, so I'm just some kid from P San Pedro grew up in San Pedro, working class longshoreman town, you know, that didn't, none of my family, no one in my family went to college. It's like, we're all just kind of, you know, it was like, like you, like lower middle class. So I started looking into uh, symbolist art which I still don't know a lot about. And I was like, that sounds exactly the way I create my artwork is the way that the, the symbolists did, which is like more stream of consciousness, intuitive. Uh, I think people tend to think of dark art as like, surre like surrealism, but s real surrealism like has a manifesto and it's like you're painting from your dreams. And uh, it seems like more specific than symbolist art, unless I don't really understand sim symbolist art. So, so I was wondering if you could explain, it seemed like, like a lot of what I, what I was reading was that it's, it's like, it's romantic. It deals a lot with death. It's very much like stream of consciousness and intuitive kind of stuff. So, but can you tell me, cause you seem um, to know all about it. Um, <laughs> the, you know, surrealism is is probably being misused, right? In in a lot of those cases, um, I think people hear the word surreal, and right. they're like, "Work is surreal," so it's surrealist, and right? It's, like, but it's is it? It's kind of like when people use the word "awesome" to describe something, <laughs> or saying I'm speechless while they're saying words out loud. <laughs> this, if you, it's like that's like Lovecraft, the unnameable horror, and right? Then he goes, it. You know, so like, we just use these words a lot of time. Right. Maybe, I guess what I'm saying is the work might not really be surreal as much as it's a vernacular term. True. Whereas everything really is symbol. Right. But like symbol is just a more accurate word, probably for 99% of the people that are looking at these terms. Symbolism, is it related to the Salon Rosa Croix, did have a manifesto. Hmm. But symbolism was infinitely larger. Uh, it's like there was a gallery called La Art Nouveau Bing, which is where the term comes from. But there were Art Nouveau artists in other countries that happened to be working in a manner that aligned with all of this. So you could be a 
a symbolist and not have had anything to do with the salon in Paris. Mm. And so the simplest way to put it is that it, you were entering a point in human development where we had telescopes and microscopes. And so in the, in the, you know, 1880s, you had people like Flammarion, uh, talking about markings on the moon and, you know, all of these things that, that scientifically we were becoming very educated as a planet. And in response to that, there were people also then taking a deeper look at the internal landscape. Uh, Art Nouveau, the idea of combining art with nature was a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. It was like a treatise for the Matrix. Oh my gosh, there's a factory on the outside of town. Machines are going to ruin our world. We, and then so people were grasping toward nature. Well, so symbolism was the idea that you had things like the Theosophical Society happening. You had a very renewed interest in the metaphysical and the occult. And so much like expressionism after World War I, symbolism was like a gentler version of expressionism. Hmm. Um, expressionist art, people came back from the war and you had an artist that maybe did beautiful, beautiful landscape drawings. But how would you convey what it felt like to be in a trench getting bombed? Right. And then all of a sudden you're tearing the paper like Stan, like Stan Krawcheck. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's definitely from the realm of expressionism. Right. So take it back three decades. And when you're back in the late 19 uh, or late 1800s, um, it was it was a more considered metaphysical exploration and the idea that there's a great Neil Gaiman quote uh, that says a story need not have happened to be true and there's a great uh, quote from the little prince that says what is essential is invisible to the eye <laughs> and symbolism sits right in between those two ideologies and so when someone is painting um, a landscape and the colors aren't what they saw, but what they felt mm. that's starting to get into symbolism when you're putting figures in, like for example, uh, Dante, uh, and Beatrice were really popular during that period. The reason that people would do a lot of illustrations of Beatrice was that she was a symbol of purity and so people were using literary symbols and mythological symbols um, uh, you know it was rooted in classicism but distorted in the most beautiful way into a lens um, that the world that they were depicting was not the physical tangible world that we live in right and so it is very, like Gail Pataki is a great example of someone that is using all of the symbolist ideals where there's a lot of coding, there's a lot of keys that are in there um, in a very natural way. I would say that someone like, like Chris Ulrich is someone that's using it in a really distinct way with codings. Mm -hmm. And what the symbolists were doing was not as educated as it was intuitive. Right. And so someone like, like Christopher Ulrich or Alphonse Mucha, it was really coded. It was really distinct. It was right. really, there's a, you have to like, you research this and then you understand it. Better. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas symbolist start was like, you had, you know, artists that were, um, looking at the ways a good example is kind of how people could say that superheroes are our 21st century mythologies. Right. And so the idea was, how do we look at these Greek myths and other classical figures like Dante and Beatrice? And how do we use these to convey a feeling, a story, an idea that I'm trying to convey? 
And the reason that I'm mentioning and going back to um, mentioning the specifics of myths and things like that is when you look at an artist like Odilon Radon and he's drawing a cyclops or something or, you know, like you do see a lot of that in there. And that's not inherent to being symbolism, but it was a language that people in the late 1800s knew. Like if you saw, uh, you know, a pensive sphinx or if you saw, Mm -hmm. um, you know, something with a mermaid, there's a great illustration I love where it's got this kid kind of drowning and underneath the water are all the vines twisting and there's a mermaid down there grabbing his legs. Well, Mm -hmm. the idea is like, is there really a mermaid in what's happening? Well, no, but it's kind of like, then you get into the femme fatale elements of the idea of the way that they were portraying women in the late 19th century is if you're empowered and sexualized that then you're demonic. That's a, that's another three hour podcast. (laughs) But but as it relates to symbolism, it's just like the language of the day was a lot more classical and gentle than it became when it got into the 20th century. And so a lot of what people who would, um, I would say that at their best, contemporary artists that are working kind of in the realms that you're talking about could be absolutely considered symbolist. Mm -hmm. And I think that when that happens is when people get away from just thinking decoratively, right? uh, It's a fine line because if you put the message too hard in there, then it gets heavy handed and right. um, It's a, it is a, it's a really, there's a Tashin book called Symbolism that's got to be like a $10 book that everyone should own. Okay. Everyone. It's it's one of the best books in the world. The reproductions are, you know, not not reproductions that you and I would be happy with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do keep talking about that. I actually said the other day, I really, I feel like I should do a book on symbolism just because there isn't a big expensive a beautifully produced way to look at these things. But for most people, that Tashin book, especially if you're not familiar with this movement, it can't be more than $20. Yeah, I'm going to get it. I'm definitely going to get it. Great. It's been in print for 50 years or whatever. But oh, cool. It's, um, it's got William Blake. It's got all the 19th century artists. It's, it's so many things that you'll spot in movies. Like you'll look at this piece and say, Oh, Francis Ford Coppola used that for Dracula. Right. Like you'll see all of these, all of these influences, and of course, then people like Giger were hugely influenced by all of that. And right. then different regions had different feels to them. Um, so it's very interesting to look at how an Italian or a Scandinavian might view the world of symbolism as completely different mythology, right. completely different. So it's definitely an enriching path for anyone to study. And now with the internet, um, it is, it is a, a dangerous time suck. <laughs> if you just type in 19th century symbolist art and type in a word like Russia, and you'll find these things that are just unbelievable palettes, unbelievable visuals, incredibly imaginative. It's it's all dreamscapes come to life. Right. It's the eternal landscapes. Did I answer your question or did I just ramble? Yeah, I, don't I mean, yeah, yeah. No, that, 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 <laughs> that, that, that helps a lot. It's just, you know, as, a, as an artist, and I'm sure you know this as a, as a musician, it's like I've never... I never thought about, you know, what kind of movement, what movement, just, just the way I create. It's like, absolutely, it's intuitive and that's it. Yeah. It's like, I let other people figure it out. <laughs> what, what's, what, what I am. It's like, this is what I do. And, uh, you know, and the way I paint is like, I, I, I don't feel like 
anything I can intellectually come up with is going to be better than what I'm going to, what I can intuitively come up with. Like, I feel like, you know, it's like I'm painting more in touch with my higher self or whatever. If I, well, if you were, if if you were, it's funny because I, I, uh, I joke about this with Gail Pataki that, that I've got her, I've got her lined up for the podcast, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, she, uh, uh, she's awesome. I, I teach her all the time that English is her second language. Because she's not oh, right. as articulate as she wants to be. But the thing we joke about is that, yeah, painting is her first language. Right. If she could write about it, she'd be writing books. If she could speak about it, she would be a speaker. But Exactly. You know, because she's commented that it's hard for her to articulate what some of these are about. So a lot of what our relationship has been is me then repeating things back to her that she has said to illustrate to her, no, you do know what this is about. Another really funny thing that, that has happened with her. And this is, this, this gets a little weird. This is like a little X filesy to me. There are things that she will do. And she is a punk rock girl from Detroit from the seventies. She has no interest in or understanding of any of this metaphysics. But she'll do things like she made a frame once and there was this, uh, it's a face looking down and the hair is coming down and you can't see eyes. And it's just like this weird drippy eyeball. It's just a weird freaky painting. (laughs) And then she made the frame and she put Labradite or Labradorite, am I saying it right? In the uh, in the frame, and the eye, the absence of eyes is a huge is, is the point of the painting. The absence of the vision. And I asked her why she used it, and she's like, "Well, that's just the stone that that felt right to me to use." Well, that's what you use for disorders of the eyes if you're, wow. if you're in feeling. Yeah. So there's that happens like every painting with her, right? That she does something that I'm not, a, you know, an advocate for crystal healing, but I know that like, there's just things like that, that I know where I'll say, right. Why did you do that? And she's like, well, that's just what felt right. And I'm like, well, you know, so it just kind of, it does to me, what that illustrates is that it's like, there's a reason why a cliche is a cliche, that there's a reason why some of these things do recur over the centuries is that because if you're tuned into that, right. That gestalt, the collective unconsciousness of the way we relate to the world, that these things occur in, in a vacuum. Right. I just found that really, really constantly. That's this just a fascinating element of my relationship with her. It could, she might tell you on the podcast that secretly she does research all the <laughs> fucking with me for 20 years but oh no i i know exactly what you're talking about it's funny that i I have to tell you quickly about um this book that 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 i'm waiting that's getting printed right now my my five-year project yeah uh it's called dystopia it's yes basically a mythologizing of everything i've painted for the last 20 years and telling what because i paint mostly portraits right these monster portraits yeah and it's giving the character telling you what the characters do in this world and what this world is like and the way that it we did it was mike who directed the documentary about me he interviewed me because i was like you know everyone's always been telling me you got to make a book uh, a, a game a video game a movie you know about your characters because it seems like they're all in this one world so when i decided to do it the way we came up with with figured the meaning out was that he interviewed me about each paint. I've talked about this a million times on the podcast, so I apologize to listeners, but he interviewed me and asked me what I knew for sure about the paintings and what I wasn't sure. You know, I basically, what, what do you know about this painting? And I would be like, okay, well, I've never thought about it, but now that you ask me, I know that this guy is, is going here and this is kind of what he does. And this is his function. But it wasn't like I'd never thought about it. But every time he asked me about a painting, he would he would write down everything I said. And then there was and then he'd say, like, well, what about that thing over there? And I was like, I'd be like, I don't really know what that thing is. So we would just kind of leave it out. 
So he gathered all the information based on everything I was sure about, which was completely weird to me because, like I said, I never thought about it. I just painted them, moved on, painted it, and moved on. And there was this whole world that existed, and, like, it works. And it's like, you know, there's characters, there's good guys, there's bad guys, there's politicians, kings and queens. It's like there's a whole society and I felt like if if I were to I couldn't have come up with that if I tried to. It's yeah. it's too cool. You know, it's way weirder and cooler than anything I could have come up with. So basically this whole thing it was written backwards. You know what I mean? The paintings were done first and then at completely intuitively and then he interviewed me and that's how we figured out so it was almost like he was an archaeologist, you know, digging it out of me what these things meant and then putting it, trying to put it all together. And it's like, oh, everything kind of fits together. And then it, it, so it was really uh, a weird. And I uh, the book is based on Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials because it was such a huge was when I was. A kid. Yeah, yeah. That was like my I'm falling apart. Hearts. favorite book when i was a kid yeah, me too. yeah and so i um and i worked with him on hellboy so i was like i hit him up and i got him to write the intro introduction to it oh it do could, you remember back of that book it talked about the forthcoming book thype yeah <laughs> i went into the local bookstore in the mall every week <laughs> for months and then maybe every month for years they <laughs> see me i was like and you know again no internet right. uh yes can you please check and see if and so they'd pull out the catalog and they'd flip through and look and they'd look up borrow load they're like no no sight <laughs> i do remember uh, reading that being like what the I, hell yeah, is this i mean no and i understand now like you know things be direct and whatever yeah yeah, yeah. it was oh man yeah that i, I loved that book it was so One cool that I think is valuable for artists that are listening <clears throat> is is to take comfort in the fact that there is no single way to do a thing. Right. And um, the idea that there's a proper way to do it or, you know, that um, it's, it's, it's valuable to trust your... Right. Whatever works right for you. Right. It's yeah, it's it's whatever's proper for you. There's a proper yeah. way for you to do it. Yeah. A- and you have book, to find that. This book that you're talking, you know, your dystopia book is gonna be beautiful. And if you were talking to a writer, they would be like, Well, what's wrong with you? Why couldn't you write this? Well, because that's not yeah, what I exactly. I d I don't I'm not a writer, I'm a painter. Yeah. It's and like it, they joke about don't let the person or you know, don't uh I forget the adage, but it's don't uh don't interrupt the person to tell them, I'm totally messing this up. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, don't interrupt the person doing it to tell them it can't be done. Right. Like yeah. 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 At the end of the day, the painting, the book, all of it. Uh, I think that the more in touch someone is with themselves, uh, is where the mo- the most, um, What's the word? Authentic, I guess, is, you know, yeah. but that would be the biggest thing. When I see someone's work and I can tell that it's not quite there, it's, there's two things that are missing. One is that they haven't really embraced themselves. Right. And then the other part is that it really does. I mean, I, I don't want to say this to, to contradict completely what you and I were just talking about. But if you're doing something like Jack Kerouac writing on the road, stream of consciousness took an incredible amount of discipline. Right. And so you can't be a painter and not understand layering and luminosity unless really what you want is something that's flat. Right. And the thing is that most people in their hearts, they it's not what they want. They do want this particular look, but they can't do it. So right. then they just kind of say, well, this is what I do. And it's like, I do think it's important to, to, to be perpetually dissatisfied enough that you keep working. Mm-hmm. But this is the way that I always explain it when I'm trying to talk to someone about like business advice or 
um, meaning like they're working on their business. And I, I would, for me, I push myself so hard that there's never a day where I beat myself up that I could have done better. Mm -hmm. I just know that there's no, like, right. There's no more fuel in that tank. Right. <laughs> I'm, told, I'm with you I on know. there. With you there. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing is you have to kind of look at yourself. Could I have done better? And then, you know, and then you have that moment where I, uh, you know, I, uh, the voice in my head is like an inmate, like weight <laughs> trainer or something <laughs> where it's, you know, there's like screaming and like, you could do better. You could right. push this. And, <laughs> But then at the end of the day, I don't beat myself up over it, you know, and so I, I guess I'm just saying that to kind of explain that contradiction is that, yes, you have to trust your process, you have to do all that, but you also have to not fool yourself into saying that I'm really focusing on articulating on what I want my work to be. Right. And, and, and striving for it because it's, you know, painting is, people take it for granted it's hard. Yeah. It's, you know, that's, it, that goes, kind of goes back to, to what I was saying before about, you know, once you, once you make that decision, I'm going to put this, this is the important thing, the painting. Like when I sit down to paint, it's like, I feel like I'm waiting for the painting to tell me what it wants me to do. And my job is to serve it as best I can. You know, like this being wants to be seen for what this creature, this painting or whatever. It wants to be seen and it needs to be seen. So it's it's like it will tell me through feeling if I'm doing it right. And I can't serve the painting if I don't know what I'm doing technically. So it's like it, it, you, I use that to I mean, I'm interested, too. I just I want to be better and better all the time. But I, I feel like also I can't if I want to serve the painting uh, I have to know what I'm doing. I have to learn all the technical stuff that maybe even isn't that fun to learn. Just technical things. It's like, you know, well, you have the skill set so that when you get your ego out of the way, right? You're just the painting. I'll mention Gail Pataki again. She studied in an Italian atelier program. They didn't let her use color for the first two years. Wow, wow, that's amazing. Like, talk about boot camp. Yeah. <laughs> Ask her about art boot camp and she'll laugh. And it's, uh, yeah, they didn't let her use color. Like you had to master your sense of shape. Right. And depth and all of that before you, because color's a crutch. Right. Because yeah. you, get, you get the dopamine rush of that red or that. Right, right. But you get it's, yellow. Yeah, but it's the value that is important. The value yeah. is so much more important than color. It's like if you don't have the value right, it doesn't matter. If And if you do have the value right, you can kind of use any color. And it's still going to look right, you know. But um, I've heard that about. I've heard how how uh, schools like that. I never went to school. I wish I had. I would love. To, I would love to go now. I'd love to go to like a hardcore, serious art atelier like that. But um, yeah, like the first year, they don't even let you paint. It's all you have to draw. It's all pencil work and shading I, and drawing I from casts. You know, plaster right, casts. If, if I remember, I think her first year was pencil and charcoal. Year two was paint, and then year three was it's color. color. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds brutal, but you know, when she, it's really interesting because when she started, uh, realism had not had the resurgence that it's had. Like, she was. Uh, she was a coconut floating in the ocean. <laughs> I remember it was really funny. We, I, I was. I was good friends with Basil Gogos. Oh, really? First met Basil and his wife, Linda, and she's wonderful. He's such a huge in influence on my work. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. But yeah. So we used to go to museums together. But so when uh, we met Basil and Linda, and she uh, said to Gail, oh, well, you know, you're a, I'm a painter. What do you do? She's like, oh, I'm a painter, too. What do you do? And Gail said, well, I do representational art. And and Linda said, really, still? <laughs> <laughs> and we, I remember laughing, like, she's very New York, and her work is abstract and outstanding, and, you know, she's, she's in a different place. Right. And, uh, but that's how uncommon it was right. for, to meet someone. Yeah, yeah. That, 
representational art. And, you know, again, this is going back, you know, 20 plus years. And so it is interesting to see how it's had, like now there's all these galleries that that's what they specialize in. Yeah. But it, it was very wild west. Yeah. Wild west or, yeah. I just, I feel like it's, it's, I don't know. I like representational stuff. I like, yeah, uh, you, know, I, you know, it's, it's like, it sounds dumb and like pedestrian and uncultured to say, but I really, I mean, I really like it because that's what I like. That's a bottom line. I just have always liked that since I was a kid, but it's also, it's, it's more people's art. You know what I mean? Cause you don't need a degree to understand it. It's like, you it, it, it's for I, I see representational art even like the, the kind of stuff i'm doing and dark art and fantasy work or whatever the stuff that gail does it's like you can look at it and appreciate it because it's beautiful and it's weird and it's cool and you don't have to you don't have to have some you don't have to you can be a regular person and enjoy it and appreciate it and i like that I, about about i that. think i'm, I'm going to say this to partially contradict you but okay. further your, your, your idea <laughs> you, i don't think you have an understanding of how much contemporary and cutting edge art and all of that is the emperor's new clothes yeah like it's i absurd i think yeah i agree i think you're i'm right. very uncomfortable in so many of those worlds because you're hearing people talk and it's i'm like can you hear yourself like the rhetoric right. goes in yeah, circles. It's, and it's, it's like, like the art form is the bullshit talking around it. Yeah, <laughs> There's yeah, more that, effort put into that. That is exactly correct. The rhetoric is what the art is. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying that in a joking way about contradicting you in the sense of that I think that the part of, the, of what you said that's most accurate is that people own up to it. This is what I like. This is what right. I need to. I think that a lot of people who look at, like it's different. There are artists like Malevich that did just like the black square and stuff like that. And in 1901, that was unbelievable. Right. Yeah, yeah. But when someone is doing it in, you know, 2021, and it's like a big Lucite block or something, they're decorating a rich person's yeah. lot. <laughs> they, yeah, but it represents this. It's like, you know, I just having met a lot of those artists and a lot of those people, it's just the pretension yeah. is through the roof. And I, I so I think that um, it's, uh, I think that there are examples in both worlds that are deeply authentic. Yeah, I agree. And deeply pretentious. Yeah, and so I think that if totally. you spend time in that other world, you might find a few things that you do really resonate with. Yeah, I I, I agree. And I've, I've always said, you know, because it's like the common thing for a guy like me is like, you know, all this crazy conceptual art. It's all a bunch of bullshit, blah, blah, blah. But to, uh, the way I feel about it actually is they both can exist and they're both valid. And my only issue really is that the, that stuff gets preferential treatment as the top, as the highest art you can I, That do. I agree with. Completely. And it's like, you know what? I have an appreciation for, for all that. I, I can, I can dig it. Like, you know, have you ever looked at Malevich or, or Mondragon? No, I don't, not that okay. I know of those. They're, they're deeply, deeply rooted in elements of mysticism. Oh, cool. So when you look at like, have you looked at, um, do you know the Frere illustrations for like the Yaka Burma ideologies? No, <laughs> uh, it's in the Mooka books so oh, okay. see those, and they look like, uh, Tom Waits calls it art that looks like game boards. <laughs> okay. Like, you know, do you know, you know, Paul Laffley's work? No. <laughs> oh my God. You need to look up Paul. I know, I know you need to. He's, he just died recently. Um, I'm writing it down. I ca I discovered him through disinformation. Do you remember those? Oh books? yeah. Yeah. I love those books. Uh, Richard Metzger had two of his paintings and, uh, did a thing on his TV show with Paul and, um, that's a whole other avenue, but yes, Paul Laffley, <laughs> uh, but, but so the, 
the thread that you and I share in common, which is that interest in the metaphysics of art, mm -hmm. there is contemporary art that seems very, very avant-garde that does hold that thread that I understand most people that are interested in contemporary art do not have any interest in understanding right. in that way. The name I know is it. And so the thing that I agree with wholeheartedly that you said is that it gets respected because it looks good in Soho lofts and right. Mountain Beach and it, front. And it gets all the money and support. Yeah. <laughs> Like that's a whole other. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there's a lot of money that gets parked into those things, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. a whole other. So part of part of me getting actually away from selling contemporary art and into the, I've actually been spending all my time books and filmmaking. I'm just finishing up a restoration of Caligula. Yeah, right now. I've been reading. I read about. <laughs> I heard about that a while back. You, you were talking about doing that. But the. Uh, part of me getting away from the art world is just because it's um, it's it's become this weird weird like bloated cancerous carcass yep. of economics um, and the connection to art uh people have kind of transcended the need, need to own things. Uh, people will show me their art collection and I'm looking at the pictures and they're swiping on their iPad. This a, a, a quick divergence, just like this happened at Comic-Con. Someone was showing me their art collection. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, that's great. That's a great piece. And I'm like, wait a minute, you own that piece? And they're like, yeah, it's right here. And in my head, I'm thinking, I thought so-and-so owned that piece. And then we're, I figured out, again, everything is communication. The disconnect was they were telling me their art collection. It was the collection of JPEGs. <laughs> wow. And That's pretty I deep. thought in that moment, this is either an anomaly or we're seeing a new way. This is a Comic-Con. like NFTs, you know, man. NFTs. Well, then someone was in the gallery in Culver City, and she was showing me her collection of old tintype photos of corpses, of all things. Oh, wow. That sounds great. And, <laughs> yep, again, on her iPad. And I'm thinking, this is, like, this is a big collection. And in the course of the conversation, I figured out it was a collection of JPEGs. And in that moment, I was like, oh, man, I'm standing in a brick and mortar store with oil paintings <laughs> and 19th century furniture. And and so I think that um, it's a very challenging time for artists because I think that the tangible creation of work is essential to the success of our society like mm -hmm. i think it's that level of important right and and the economy of creation doesn't support that people really expect things for free in a completely right. unprecedented way so i i empathize with uh with the dilemma my personal uh extrication from it is not making the commerce responsible for my well-being, which is why the movie work has been uh, financially rewarding and that there's enough antique art and stuff that I have that I can keep a living going. Hmm. But we've been focusing on the publishing and especially things like Temple of Medusa. It's a beautiful thing. So we've completely shifted our commission structure on art that we sell. I oh, think wow. the 50 is outdated. I think right. that a gallery doesn't need to take that in 2021. Like it, it doesn't, I think that the more important thing that a gallery can be doing is being an assistant and an advisor than anything. Right. Um, 
And so I've kind of, you know, for me, I've shifted into that role. And the Temple of Medusa thing is is kind of starting that direction. I really love uh, sharing experience in a way that helps other people avoid pitfalls. And um, But the entire art world, you go to something like L.A. Art, and it's like these giant canvases where it's like someone poked a pinhole in the middle. <laughs> And it's like sixty thousand dollars, and it's got a red dot. Right. It's like, it's like, yeah, it's someone, you know, it's uh, someone money. who's yeah, who was told that this was right, in- right. Which is that's the other thing that why why I um, I'm suspicious of those kinds of artists because it's like really you're trying to tell me that you made that giant canvas with the pinhole in the middle because. You thought it was the fu- fucking awesome, amazing idea. Oh, I got to admit, because this is how I approach every painting. It's like, oh, I want to I want to paint this. I want to paint this. It's so cool. I can't wait to paint this. Like, I'm so into it. I'm into the process of painting it. That's that's how I paint paintings. And most artists, I think, are painting what they, you know, people that are painting from their heart. They're doing it because they think it's so cool and they love it. And you're trying to tell me that the, you know, the pinhole in the canvas or the pair of dirty underwear in the corner of the gallery you're so jazzed about that idea that you couldn't wait to create it share it bullshit well it, it def- i'm not buying it <laughs> yeah in defense of modern art there are people that have sat and thought and thought and right. thought and then they did come up with a thing i do believe and i'm saying this so it's not like you know how Joe Rogan, like whoever he's talking to, he changes his opinion. Like, I'm <laughs> yeah. trying to make sure that I'm being solid on this, which is that there are artists that do contemporary things that do have I that. agree, man. I but totally I agree. But I think that the playing field, because it's so rhetorical and conceptually based, that it's very easy for somebody who's full of shit yeah. to just come in and kind of be like, yeah, I, I was – you know, I took a shit on a plate and I laminated it, and right. this is how I feel about media. Right, right. <laughs> or the banana on the yeah. wall. Yeah, the banana on the wall is a great. Ex- <laughs> it's a perfect example. Yeah. Like it's, you I, know, we in the social media realm. I, I got to tell you one one quick uh, example of this is I, you know, I used to work in effects. Uh, I know a guy that worked at a shop that was hired by a conceptual artist because you know. They don't create the, the work themselves. They hire shops, makeup effects shops a lot of time. Right. Um, I worked for Paul McCarthy for a little couple of years because he, uh, you know, that guy, Paul McCarthy, the artist who does the crazy transgressive. Yeah. From the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the guy who's like M- Pinocchio video, of Pinocchio pouring mustard and mayonnaise all over himself and a weird evil chef. I don't. He was big in the, he's still, I mean, he's, He's got billionaire backers. He's super rich. Anyway, um, so it, besides, that's the, the it's a makeup effect shop, and he just tells them he's got this huge makeup effect shop, and it, they just make all these puppets and statues and crazy stuff. Anyway, so I know a guy that worked at a shop, a makeup effect shop, that got hired. I'm not going to mention the guy's name, either of their names, but a a fine artist. A successful fine artist hired the shop to make this mechanical prop for an art piece. And my friend, he either told it to my friend or my friend heard him talking to someone else, but he was basically saying, this is all bullshit. He's like, the concept is a bunch of bullshit. It's, you know, and it's like you, you, I saw the thing and I was like that it just, from what it's, being said about it it doesn't make sense at all i just don't get it but he was literally saying this is bullshit he's just some rich kid that's well connected went to the right art schools yeah found the right backers and he's just peddling bullshit making millions of dollars it's like in a way if art kind of represents the culture i also think this sometimes art is supposed to kind of represent what's happening in the culture that kind of in a way it is kind of accurately representing the culture in a way which is like bullshit <laughs> nothing crap and yeah. a bunch of money behind it which is like the high end of of society nowadays you know what i'm saying 
So maybe it's kind of doing its job unintentionally. It is. Uh, it is an unfortunately accurate metaphor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is correct. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow, that's depressing. Well, I'm going to go slip my wrist in the back now. <laughs> and, well, uh, th- th- uh, yeah, we, I should let you guys. But like, we're at <laughs> two two hours now. Um, well, I, I uh, yeah, tell everyone you have. I mean, aside from this amazing book, you've got so many cool books. So amazing. Um, we'll put it in the body of the text and everything, but tell people where they can go to to buy these amazing books. Centuryguild.net is the website. Uh, and it's kind of the hub for everything. And I'm really bad about posting things on social media. Uh, <laughs> so you generally hear about things thereafter. Uh, <laughs> but that's another place. But centuryguild.net is, is where the books are. And then... Um, we're starting uh, the first Thursday of every month doing I, a, a live stream thing where we're going to discuss the books. I got that. I got that email today. Yeah. Part of that is that I was on a Eon Byte Gnostic radio last month and someone was asking questions about like, what advice do you have for artists? And, and it was, um, it was just a reminder, like I'm used to having one-on-one conversations with people, but like I'm happy to share things that I know, you, and it's, it's just my experience. Yeah, and, you got to have a YouTube channel. You got to. I mean, well, you got so much to offer. You know. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. But so you know, we're gonna we'll go through the books a little bit, cool. and I'll answer questions. Like if someone has, it's like, where did you find that poster, or what's this story, or can you tell us more about this artist? It's just kind of a fun way to kind of replace what would have happened in the gallery. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Adapting. <laughs> adapting yeah. to the new world. And then the last half of it, just opening it up to general questions that if people are uh, trying to, you know, I think that, you know, I, I was joking about what you said being depressing, but I, I really do believe that it doesn't matter if you're a painter or a musician or a writer or even just someone that's, that's trying in their own lives to be connected with creativity. I just, I think that really is, the most important thing that any of us can be doing. And I think on a societal level, um, you know, it's really rare that you meet someone that's very invested in creativity and communication Mm -hmm. that turns out to be an asshole. Right. Rare. Like, yeah, it's true. Very invested in creativity, but not communication. Mm-hmm. Like and those people can be assholes, yeah. but like really focusing on that balance, um, you know, like that's that really is it is again that's the holy grail. Like that's the thing that, and so uh, for me, that's the mission with all of it. Like with the uh, with the movie stuff and the books and, um, you know, it's. Uh, it's just another, it's a crazy tangent I just have to mention because you'll think it's interesting. I'm a huge fan of Heavy Metal Magazine. Yeah, me too. That was, yeah. and so we were working on a movie uh, with actually uh, starring Jake Busey. And it's a, it's like John Wick meets El Topo. Really? And the creatures in it were designed by Esteban Moroto. Oh, no way. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that's been... Uh, that's the thing I'm trying to get get further along after after Caligula. Sounds amazing! Um, wow. And the Caligula thing, just in case, it's a terrible, terrible movie. When someone tells me they love it, I'm really nervous. <laughs> but they found all 90 hours of the original negative. Whoa! So we've been editing it to conform to Gore Vidal's script. So it's going to be. <laughs> Two and a half hours. Okay. And not one frame is a frame that anybody has seen before. Really? All new footage. That's not one crazy. Footage. What a cool idea for a project. That's amazing. Uh, I mean, it's very lucky that uh, I, I just I just got hired to do it. It's not my oh, um, okay thing, but they gave me. They came to me as an art gallery and said, "Is this?" I mean, you know, I don't, again, I want to keep you for two, three hours, but basically know. like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, 
they took me in and they showed me all of these boxes and uh, asked, is this good? And I'm opening up these cans and it's negatives. Like the story about Caligula is that Gore Vidal wrote it. Uh, Bob Guccione from Penthouse uh, funded it. Right. And Tinto Brass directed it. By the end of the movie, Gore Vidal had sued to have his name removed. <laughs> Tinto Brass had been fired. And then Bob Guccione, who'd never made a movie before, went and filmed more pornography to cut in and right. then made the spectacle of a film with no thought. Like they never they didn't even look at the script. It was like they just put this movie together. <laughs> And in one scene, Malcolm McDowell's costume will change multiple times. Like, he <laughs> said in interviews that it's a complete betrayal. Wow. And he's totally, totally right. Like, they, more than anyone, Malcolm McDowell really got the biggest shaft in this. Because he delivered a beautiful performance, mm -hmm. um, reinvented the character beyond what Gore Vidal envisioned, and then what was edited and put out was just a train wreck. Wow, and so that's kind of a famous thing in in like being the best movie that never happened. Right. The story of no, a great movie was filmed. Um, it just never got edited or released that way. So so fast forward then to the present. Uh, everybody thought that all the original materials were had been d destroyed decades ago, and. Uh, it was like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark where you're looking in these boxes and they're saying, well, is this any good? And it was all the original camera negative, some of which had never been cut into. Wow. Meaning when Bob Guccione was editing it, he would have a reel that was like a complete scene. And they never even opened the can. They took it out of the camera, put it in the can, and then put it away for 40 years. So there's wow. seven scenes in our movie that aren't in the original movie in any form. Wow. And so uh, are you, have you been documenting this so you can make a documentary about it? This would yeah, make an amazing are, documentary well, about we're, making we're, this movie again. We're making a documentary, but the real focus is going to be on the making of the film. Okay. It's, um, yeah, that's cause that's an interesting story. It's, you know, <laughs> that, that's a 12 hour podcast. It's crazy. Wow. It's crazy. Like they were actually in the casting process, having the extras perform sexual acts. I mean, it was, it was <laughs> big, grotesque. Wow. It was, had like, uh, I mean, it just, it, Oh yeah. This is an interesting thing for you. There's a whole section in the film called the harem of monsters where you just see these one second things. So the book that I have of all the Caligula set photos coming out, we have 11,000 photos that were taken on the set of the movie. There was an unbelievable prosthetics department. Wow. There's like these, cause, cause the idea was that emperor Tiberius collected freaks, wow. you know, <laughs> all over the world. So like, you know, there's Siamese twins and, uh, you know, hermaphrodites and people with like four hands, like two hands on each. So it looks like um, it looks like a bizarre horror film. Wow. And there are tons and tons and tons of characters in there, like people with carved faces. That It looks like 80s horror movie wow, stuff. Wow. Wow. How cool. And you, and you don't see it in the movie because they didn't use the footage. Right. Amazing. So yeah, so there's yeah, that was a whole other. Anyway, yeah, that's a whole other. That's <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a documentary freak. I love documentaries, so I will definitely we have. Uh, we have 20 hours of 16 millimeter footage that was shot behind the scenes. Wow. And so that's amazing. That's, instead of making the documentary about what we're doing really to me that's more interesting right. like watching helen mirren doing her dance routine stuff and then watching like a guy show up with a bunch of eels that they're going to use as right. sex toys and it's, <laughs> it, it just it was a complete wow wreck of uh 
of egos and <laughs> I'm trying to not start talking because I'll just start. There's so crazy. Well, w- uh, we hope. F- w- would you come back again sometime? Oh my god, anytime! I appreciate you doing this. I feel like you know we barely really. I feel like we barely <laughs> scratch the surface. There's so much stuff I, I want to talk to you about, but this was really excellent, and I really appreciate you coming on. What a what a an excellent, uh, interesting episode. People are going to be stoked to oh, man. to listen to it. So long overdue. It's, it's I really know. Fun. I mean, think of you and I talking just in the sense of, you know, Christopher Ulrich is is someone that I'm really, really, like I have deep love for. Yeah, like he's, he's, he's a, a genius. Real special person. Yep. And he just always spoke so highly of you. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, We're good which, friends. You know, yeah. But he just always, he would always mention you in in a way that he didn't talk about other people oh. like in a way that was like really warm and i just you know it's kind of that thing where when someone that you have yeah. that emotional <laughs> connection with has that with someone else you're like god you know that's yeah yeah you um, want your friends to be friends <laughs> yeah i'm just like you know part of what happens in my life is that like i get in this bubble where i'm working constantly right. yeah and so in a funny way like one of the rare times that i actually left my house I did go to one of your shows. Oh, cool. And there were like 16,000 people <laughs> outside. There was no way in hell I was getting inside. So I hung out outside for a little bit and I went home. Sorry. And- <laughs> <laughs> well, I got another show coming up at Copper on the 9th. This Saturday. I can't believe it. This sat- this is what I'm working towards. So there's probably going to be a lot less people there because uh, of COVID. But um yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll uh, yeah, we'll stay in touch. I got to send you a bunch of stuff too. I, I need to send you some stuff. But um, thanks for coming on the show. And and we say we have to say goodbye to everybody at the end. And then don't hang up when I stop recording. So um, so say uh, goodbye, audience. Goodbye, audience. Goodbye, audience.